from the University of uh, Milano. Now, um, <coughs> this is actually a picture which has been taken at a competition of, of lorry pullers, and uh, you see, uh, and I think that's essentially the point of my talk, um, there is obviously friction, this guy wants to pull the lorry, and what I'm going to show you today is how you can control friction, but also can how you can avoid friction. Now, uh, friction is, of course, you all know about friction. Whenever you have two surfaces in relative motion, right, then there is uh, friction. And uh, typically in industrialized uh, countries, it's about 10% of the GNP which is dumped in, in compensating for frictional losses. This is uh, partially energy losses, but uh, you know that friction can also to lead to severe damaging of, of devices, it can cause device failure, can uh, make uh, crack uh, propagate. <coughs> and that's the reason why um, friction has been investigated uh, since a long time. Uh, on the other hand, um, when talking about friction, uh, and uh, it's not only about minimizing friction, but there are at least examples where you rely on friction, right? In particular, being in Les Ouches, um this person here heavily relies on friction, and um, I'm not sure whether that work uh, here in my, my, my talk will help you to, to, to get a better grasp, but if you fall down, you might know at the end why that happens. But also, if you play an instrument, you might rely on friction. I mean, the reason that we're all here is because there is static friction when we move, and there is also a lot of devices which only work because there is friction. And therefore, um, when talking about friction, we better talk about controlling friction because depending on the specific situation, you want to have it large, you want to have it small. And <coughs> as physicists, we know if I want to control something, I should uh, better understand it. And actually, the first person who was uh, systematically looking into friction, I'm sure even, even the Egypts were uh, concerned about friction, I'm sure about that, but the first person who was systematically looking into friction was uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and he was doing this type of experiments. I'm sure you have seen that in your, in your, in your, in, in school where you are pulling a piece of wood with a rope across uh, a table, and from that experiments, and that's actually one of his original hand drawings in one of his notebooks. Um, he observed that, and that's pretty obvious, that friction is proportional to the load, right? If you, if you add some load here, then of course you have to pull harder to make it move. Um, friction is also independent of velocity. That's not that trivial, and, um, and, uh, but this uh, holds for a lot of materials. But the most uh, astonishing thing about friction is friction is independent of the contact area. And actually, I, I wanted to show you an experiment today, but I was not sure how, uh, how the setting is here. And that's the reason why I recorded a movie. So this is now in the spirit of Leonardo <coughs> da Vinci. So this is this block. And the statement is the friction, which is here measured with a with a with a force with a just with a spring, you so you the, the extension of this white bar here tells you how much I pull. The friction should be independent whether I the the block is like that or it's like that. Okay, and this is exactly what you see here. You see, look at the extension of the white bar, and now I turn it. <laughs> we have less area, and it's about the same extension. That's surprising, isn't it? I mean, naively would say, well, if I make the content large, friction is large because it's interfacial phenomena. That is obviously not the case. And all these findings can be kind of summarized, or at least one and three, into this Amantin's law that the friction force is uh, given by a material dependent friction coefficient and the load. Now, why friction is independent of the contact area? Well, it took a couple of hundred years until this has been understood. Also, I should say, even nowadays, it, this is not fully clear. This is what makes friction a kind of a complex uh, issue. Bowden and Tabor realized that, uh, of course, if you have two surfaces attaching to each other, 
uh, it's not as ideal as I sketch it here. <coughs> that is what I call the apparent uh, contact area. Uh, of course, both surfaces, in particular when it comes to macroscopic surfaces, are uh, atomically r uh, rough, okay, so they are only uh, attach each other at certain points, which we call asperities. That means that the true, the real contact area is much smaller than the apparent contact area, right? And the point is now that if you apply a force, um, you can plastically and elastically deform these asperities. And the presence of these asperi asperities have been only, uh, well, in 2004, uh, been, uh, been, been, been managed to be uh, directly imaged in an experiment. This is a macroscopic experiment where you have a block of plexiglass and another block of plexiglass and you slide that on top of each other and now to image the asperities you have a laser beam coming from below at an angle where there would be normally a total internal reflection. Okay, so normally if the upper part, if the upper uh, slider would be absent, the laser beam would go in and would go out, right? It's like if you dive into water and look outside, you cannot look outside because you're looking from the high density medium to the low density medium, so you have total reflection. However, at that point where asperities forms, the upper block touches the lower block, and that is where the uh, rays go straight through and therefore just by measuring the intensity here this is a measure of the real surface where the particles uh, where, where the two blocks are in true contact and from that experiment indeed you measure that the real contact area is proportional to the load you can also uh, push this uh, uh, onto the onto the lower part and uh, from those measurements, aha, and I should so that's an important point here. This is a non trivial statement actually, because if you consider a single asperity, let's say in terms of a Hertz model, where you have a elastical sphere pushing on a hard wall, there this contact area scales as the force to the power of two thirds, right? The fact that this is true obviously suggests that there is also some elastical interaction between asperities. I think that's even till today it's not fully understood. But uh, anyway, from that experiment you also um, can measure the frictional force. You see that is also proportional to the area and uh, from that you can recover uh, Amontan's law. Okay. Now, um, what I'm talking about today is not friction of between macroscopic surfaces. I'm more interested in friction between two ideal surfaces. And this is a realistic situation when you come to micron-sized contact. You know that uh, also mechanical devices, similar to electronic devices, become smaller and smaller. And therefore, people are also truly interested in having small gears operated on the 100 nanometer scale and at that conditions it's really an ideal contact and this um, uh, this realm is called nanotribology and um, I just want to look uh, with you at two models uh, the one is the Tomlinson model which kind of mimics the situation of an AFM um, measuring the force, the friction force on a periodic surface. So this is the tip of the AFM here. It's uh, connected via a spring to, to, the, to a bar. This bar is moving with a constant velocity. This corresponds here just to a piezo scanner. This here is the cantilever. And if you solve the corresponding um, equation of motion of the tip, this is what you obtain. You obtain this typical uh, stick-slip motion and this is also in very good agreement with experimental results. So this is for the idea, uh, for the situation <coughs> where we have a point contact. And this is now, and this is what I'm concerned with, uh, this is an extended contact. So the orange uh, sinusoidal um, line, so that is the lower surface, right? This is just the substrate potential form to the atoms here in the lower part. And the atoms of the first monolayer of the upper part, this is just mimicked here. That's just the 1D representation 
of beads which are connected via harmonical springs. Okay? And this is the so-called frankel kontorova model. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. It appears in very different contexts in physics, a very uh, important model actually, very simple model, but I will show you it's actually not that simple. Um, in contrast to the Tomlinson model, it has two length scales. So we have here the periodicity of the substrate, AS, and the periodicity of the uh, this will be eventually colloidal particles, that's why I call it AC, um, and it actually is the ratio between those which defines whether this situation is commensurate or not, right? If this is an integer, it's a commensurate thing. If this is a non-integer, it's, it's not commensurate. And just to show you that this incommensurability uh, plays an important role, I show you that data. These are expe actually experimental data. If you uh, do an AFM scan on a graphite surface, after some time you will observe that there is a flake of graphite which is detached and which adheres to your cantilever. And normally people then stop the experiments because then you lose atomic resolution. But these guys here were continuing and they were just now um, measuring the friction force, the lateral friction force of a sliding graphite layer which is rubbing on graphite. This is measured here and what they varied is the relative angle of the two lattices. Okay, and what you see here that every 60 degrees we have a very high friction and below there is almost zero friction. And this can be nicely understood in terms of such a frankel kontorova model. Um, when you are at 60 degrees or multiples of 60 degrees because of the rotational symmetry of graphite, there is a registration, so that's what I try to mimic like that. And if, you're, if you rotate the two surfaces relative to each other, you bring the system out of registry, which then uh, leads to the almost complete disappearance of friction. Uh, this also shows you that um, indeed on an atomic scale, this kind of ideal contacts are not completely unrealistic. I think here that the typical size of the contact is something like, might be 10 by 10 microns or something like that. Okay, now um, coming back to this, to this frankel kontorova model, there is an interesting uh, prediction. What we can ask now, if we have such a situation, we have particles connected via harmonic springs, they interact with the sinusoidal potential and now we pull on this chain. So we apply a force to each of the particles. The question is what would happen, how this chain actually would move. Um, well, if the, if the spring, if this chain is infinitely stiff, of course it would behave as a single effective particle. It would display the same stick-slip motion. But because there is a finite stiffness, something different happens. Actually, one can show that because of thermal fluctuations, a so-called kink can form. So two particles can occupy a single potential well, or three particles can occupy two potential wells. That's here the most simple case. And what you immediately see is, because of repulsive forces, these particles push themselves energetically up. And if you now apply a force to each of the particles, this particle here has to overcome the smallest potential barrier. And that's the reason why this particle will jump. And in King's language, this simply means that the kink has propagated by one lattice side. Okay? And it can be shown that such propagating or running kinks provide the most efficient way for mass transport uh, between uh, such surfaces. And when talking about friction, we essentially talk about mass transport, right? Because we are moving mass relative to each other. Uh, interestingly, so, so what you would expect is that the more kinks you have in a system, the smaller is the friction. But interestingly, these kinks have not been observed. Uh, it's very difficult to see that in an AFM experiment because um, you cannot at the same time, um, you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot easily measure the position of the particles relative to the underlying substrate. And that's the reason why um, we wanted to change that by bringing the system to the micron scale. So what we are doing now, we are 
making a more or less ideal frankel kontorova system on a micron scale. And this is done by using colloidal particles, similar like the ones I showed you yesterday, uh, and to provide subspace potentials with micron uh, length scales, we use uh, interfering laser beams, okay? So we use optical tweezers. You all know that if you have a uh, dielectric object, a colloidal particle, and subject it to a light field, it always will go to the location where the light intensity is largest, okay? And now simply by interference patterns, you can create all different types of, of, of substrate potentials. So the way you have to read that is wherever the um, intensity is high, there is a potential minimum where the potential, uh, where, the, the, where the intensity is low, where it's black, there is a maximum, okay? And uh, we can even make quasi-periodic substrate potential if there is enough time. We're coming back to that at the end of the talk. So in the following, we will essentially use uh, one, one, one surfaces by interference of three uh, laser beams. And the nice thing is that we can now, by changing the light intensity, we can easily change the, the amplitude, the substrate strength, but we can also easily change the lattice constant of the substrate by changing the tilting angle. So this can be all done in situ. That's a very nice way to adjust the substrate perfectly or on purpose might be to make incommensurate conditions uh, uh, relative to the uh, concentration or to the lattice constant of the colloidal particles. Uh, this is how, how it looks like. I mean, this is a major experiment where you have to align a lot of optics, but might be that's not too interesting here. So that's just uh, very uh, ideally, so the different steps you have to do to, to make the experiment. We start with a colloidal suspension. These are particles, uh, I think it's a two and a half micrometer in diameter. Um, they are charge stabilized. <coughs> and because we want to make a crystalline monolayer, we have to reduce the uh, the ions in the solvent, which would screen the electrostatic interactions. And this is done by a deionization circuit, which takes away all the ions so we can uh, control how strong they interact with each other. We can also adjust the particle density by having a scanning laser tweezer, which is making a corel, and by confining or expanding this corel, we can adjust the particle density. Um, what is quite important is um, if you go to high particle densities and everything is, again, in a thin sample cell, particles uh, are likely to, so to say, expel from the surface, right? They, they want to avoid the presence of these strongly repulsive interactions. And to avoid that, we have another laser beam, an expanded laser beam, which is pushing the particles towards the surface. Well, then we have to um, shine in these three interfering laser beams. Well, and at the end, and that's the only thing which is missing, we have to apply a, a lateral driving force. So in principle, you could say, well, um, one could move the interference pattern. This could be done by introducing phase shifts between the different lasers. What we have done is something different, which works even nicer. Um, so this is the subspray potential. Uh, and this here is a colloidal monolayer in a sample cell. This is a silica couette. Uh, and we just mount this couette on a phaso stage, on a translational stage, and move the entire stage. And by doing so, we simply exert a Stokes force on each particle, right? I mean, you can ask yourself what you have to do to keep a particle fixed in space, and it's clear you have to pull in that direction, right? That means by moving the sample stage together with the liquid, the liquid pulls the particles to the right. So by variation of the uh, velocity of the piezo stage, we can then simply vary the, uh, velocity, uh, the force acting on the particle, okay? It's a little bit more complicated, but <coughs> This is essentially how it works in the experiments. Okay, that is now the first situation. This is for commensurate surfaces. I should say in all the experiments I'm showing you today, the force points always from the left to the right. 
So this is commensurate, that means the lattice constants of the colloids of the colloidal crystal and that of the substrate are identical. So in that case it's 4.7 micrometers and we just pull here uh, the monolayer in, the in one of the uh, crystal uh, lattice uh, directions. Okay, And this is what you uh, obtain here, we plot the mean particle velocity, we do particle tracking so we can measure the mean particle velocity uh, and we do that as a function of the force. And this is this uh, nonlinear curve, this is a very typical result and you will easily understand why that is. For small forces, um, the forces are too small to pull the particles out of the substrate potentials. Yeah? In the absence in the in the absence of a laser it's still a crystal right we have a confining we have a conf aha might be your question is because they repel why they would form a crystal okay very good question it's exactly there's a confinement you have to add so many particles that the walls make the system yes but uh, might be misaligned right so we essentially align it here uh, because of the of the laser field. That's actually how we do it. We first form the crystal and then we adjust the laser field in order to get it, in that case, commensurate or, as you will see later on, non-commensurate. Okay, so for small forces, <coughs> think about particles. They are sitting in the potential well, but now you have to pull them out and because they have to overcome a finite potential barrier, this takes some force and for small forces, they just reside there. These are the particle trajectories. And then, and this is actually the most interesting part, there is a deepening transition where we have a strongly nonlinear uh, behavior where, interestingly, a part of the particles move and another part does not move. Okay? And only if we go to even larger pulling forces, and large in our case means something like 150 femtonewton, which is still quite small, but in our case this is a large driving force, then you see the trajectories just move here in the direction of the pulling force. Interestingly, if you would do a pair collation function here, or if you would look at the particle distribution in the co-moving frame, it would, would almost look like an undistorted colloidal crystal. So here, this is just a totally sliding state. The more you pull, the less important is the corrugation of your substrate. Now, um, we can do more. Um, <coughs> we can not only measure mean velocities, because we have full uh, single particle uh, resolution, we can also measure the particle velocity on a single particle level. This is what you see here for different pulling forces. In blue are the fast particles, and you see um, that fast particles tend to group in clusters, and the more we pull, the more they arrange in bands which are perpendicular to the pulling force. Um, what you see here, this is the, um, the so-called Voronoi area. We can, from the distance of next neighbors, we can calculate how much the colloidal crystal is either squeezed or expanded compared to a non-driven colloidal uh, system. And you see now, that these regions where the particles are fast, that these are exactly regions where the lattice is compressed. Okay, and I just show you here a movie. You see now that these uh, regions of high velocities, they move in the direction of the applied force. Now, if, I, if you remember what I just uh, told you before about the kinks, this is exactly a kink, because we said a kink occurs when we have a local compression, and this is exactly where the particles start to move, and of course after this particle has jumped, the next particle which will jump is this one here. So a kink is characterized by a high mobility of regions where the colloidal lattice is compressed, and kinks also move in the direction of the applied force. Yes, um, that's true. If, for example, if there would be a missing, if there would be a missing uh, particle, it just would anneal, right? Mm -hmm. That's the reason why you better avoid that, because otherwise your running kink will come to a natural end.
Yes, and certainly some of the kings actually run out, but others don't, right? Okay, now this, uh, this uh, Frankel Kontorova model also makes a prediction <coughs> regarding incommensurate systems. So, incommensurability, again, remember this is when the lattice constants of the colloidal system and the subspace potential are not matching, okay? And here we have fewer particles than subspace potentials. Think about just having springs between the particles, then it's clear because they cover quite some distance, the springs will lead to an, a force, an attractive force between them, which makes these particles energetically pushed up. And again, if I ask you which particle will jump first, of course, it's this one here, right? Because it has the smallest barrier and even finds an empty space in the direction of the applied force. So this particle will jump for uh, first, but the next particle, whoops, that was too fast. The next, once this has jumped, then we have this situation, the next particle which will jump is this one here. So anti-kinks have are characterized by the fact that regions of fast particles are running opposite to the applied force, right? That's the way to distinguish kinks and anti-kinks. And, well, to make a long story short, this is essentially what we see in the experiment. Here we have now detuned the substrate uh, laser lattice. You see this is the same colloidal crystal, still, still 5.7 micrometers. And here we have now made, uh, we have changed the tilting angle between of the laser beams. And the first thing you see that even for uh, no applied force, you see here these whitish uh, bars. These are domain walls because um, due to minimization of the energy, the system prefers to locally be commensurate with the substrate, but then, uh, so to say, uh, accumulating more and more elastic energy, and then you skip one line of uh, potential substrate wells, and then you restart that. And that's something which is well known also from um, atomic systems when you consider atomic adsorbates on incommensurate substrate. This is exactly the same thing you see here. Now the color code is as before. Um, uh, fast particles are in, in blue. What you also see here is that the fast particles, of course, preferentially occur right at these domain walls. That's not too much of a surprise because the main walls, there's a next, uh, there's, an, there's an unoccupied potential well, and this is, of course, the place where a particle most easily can, can jump or can have some velocity. And again, as we've seen before, uh, these kinks tend to uh, arrange in lines perpendicular to the applied uh, pulling force. And here again, this is the um, Voronoi cell construction, but this time you see I go back here. Here we have seen that the fast regions correspond to the compressed region. The fast particles correspond to the dark green regions. This is now exactly the opposite here. The fast regions correspond to the dilated regions. Okay, And this is exactly what we expect from an anti-kink. If you remember, and just to convince you that this is indeed an anti-kink, I just show you here the movie, these are this uh, velocity maps, and indeed you see that the velocity maps, the velocity regions, region of high velocity, move opposite to the applied force. Of course, still each particle is jumping in the direction of force, but the sequence of these jumps is now just reversed uh, compared to the, to, uh, to, uh, to the kink. Um, so this is a comparison between the mean velocity between commensurate and incommensurate um, uh, um, uh, situations. And what you see here is that the friction coefficient or the, I mean the, the velocity for a given force is larger in incommensurate, uh, in incommensurate sit situations compared to commensurate situations, which means that the friction coefficient of incommensurate uh, surfaces is smaller than for commensurate conditions. And that is from a microscopical point of view simply because it's more easy to nucleate anti-kinks if you have already a lot of, 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 of vacancies. In fact, we see here also much more anti-kinks than kinks.
And this is already a good indication that indeed the more kinks or anti-kinks you have, the smaller is the friction in your system. Now let me come back uh, to the to the kink. I show you here again a snapshot of a of a kink. So here this is this compressed region which is now moving from the left to the right. And what you see here is just the trajectories of the particles here. This is the left mode one, and this here is the right mode, uh, rightmost uh, of the particles. And what you see, if this compression zone uh, wipes over this chain of particles, there is a consecutive hopping. So first, this particle will jump exactly by one lattice side, as we expected from a kink. And then the second particle jumps in the third, and only at the very end, this particle here jumps. And from that plots here, you can nicely calculate the velocity of the kink, and you can compare that to the velocity of a particle. And what you see immediately is that the kink is much faster than a particle. And in fact, if you have a kink of width L, L times the lattice spacing of the substrate, then you can show <coughs> that the kink moves L times faster than a particle. This is simply because <coughs> while the entire kink moves over its own width over a particle, each particle just makes a jump by one lattice side. Okay? And from such a relation here, you can now make a very simple model. Um, uh, this here is now the probability distribution of the particles in such a monolayer. Um, you see already that only the particles in the kink move. So mo most of the particles actually don't move at all at a given time. Of course, if you wait sufficiently long, every particle has to move. You cannot leave a particle behind, but if you make a snapshot, only a tiny fraction of particle moves, and that's the reason why if you do the velocity probability distribution, you have a huge peak at particle velocity zero, the broadening simply due to Brownian noise. And here, this is velocity about 400 nanometers per second. This corresponds to the particle being in the kink. And uh, if you do a one-dimensional model, you can simply say, well, the mean particle velocity is just the velocity of the particles in the kink times the number of particles being in a kink, which is the number of kinks times the width of a kink, and then you have to divide it by 1 over n to get a mean value. And with the relation I showed you before, this now gives you an expression which only depends on the kink properties. And I think this underlines, again, the importance of kinks. The more kinks you have, the faster the kinks move, the larger is the velocity, so the smaller is the uh, friction. And this can be now tested in our experiments. Um, we can independently, I showed you already that we can measure the mean velocity directly by looking at the, at the particles by the video tracking, but we can independently measure also the number of kinks and the velocity of kinks. And if we do that expression here, then you see we find very good agreement here between the simple expression and uh, the, the true measured values, both for commensurate and incommensurate systems. And I think this clearly uh, supports the idea that these kinks and anti-kinks uh, are important to understand friction at such a, uh, at small length scales where you have truly perfect contacts. Yeah. Yes, you uh, actually, you get what you see is um, if you form if you form <coughs> a kink here and an anti-kink here, and you pull in that direction, the kink moves in that direction, the anti-kink moves in that direction, so they annihilate. We also have seen that, right? I mean, you have pinning. That's, I think there was a question which has been asked before. If you have defects in the system, they might become pinned, right? So uh, that's the reason why you better avoid having defects in the system. I should say um, what we do actually, um, our, our laser interference pattern, which is about the, uh, which, which comprises a substrate potential, is on the order of a square millimeter. It's very large. Our field of view 
is much smaller. It's about two by s 200 by 300 micrometers. And of course, we first scan a little bit around in order to make sure that there are not uh, defects. Otherwise, um, uh, we have, well, unwanted side effects, right? I mean, this is only true when I'm telling you if you have a perfect periodic system and of course if you have kink anti-kink interactions they can annihilate if you have defects this can also lead to a modification of that picture now um, again let me show you uh, the comparison between the commensurate and the incommensurate system um, we see uh, as expected i mean also naively if i would have asked you where you think friction is smaller in the commensurate or an incommensurate system of course you would have told me right away well in an incommensurate system friction should be smaller which is true but what you still see in both cases that there is a static friction right you still have to apply a minimal force in order to get the system moving and what I want to show you now um, is how to make static friction to go away. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, but no, actually, at some point, at some point, um, and that's so to say, an, an artifact of our system. The friction in our system is eventually dominated by viscous friction, right? Because still. We have colloids in water, right? So this is the true limitation, even if you go for very high, it's a Stokes force, if you want to say, right? That's exactly what I, what I want to show you now. Okay, so <coughs> how to make also the static friction go away? I mean, if you think about the implications, if there would be no static friction, if, if this, I'm not sure whether this is, I guess it's screwed in, but let's assume it just would rest here on the floor. If there would be no static friction, it would be sufficient, well, I'll show you the movie, it would be sufficient just to slightly push something and it would respond, okay? This is the, uh, so this Laurie Puller, we have seen at the beginning, he would be extremely happy of having no static friction because it would allow him to at least get the the van into rolling and <coughs> the question is how could this work and um, there is a old prediction from Serge Aubry uh, in 1983 so he was also considering the uh, Frankel Kontorova system he considered an infinite chain incommensurate you see the particles are not always here at the minima so they are at different phases here that's a truly incommensurate chain and he considered that at t equals zero and what he predicted is that under such condition there is a minimal but still finite value of the substrate potential where if you apply even the smallest possible force this would be sufficient to make the chain move, okay? This is the Aubrey transition. And this here is uh, the, uh, this is the prediction. Actually, he could rigorously prove it for that particular case, infinite chain, incommensurate, and at t equals zero. And what you see here is a more recent numerical simulation of a 2D system at finite temperature, which shows qualitatively actually the same. Uh, this is again the mean particle velocity. This actually has been already adopted to our colloidal experiment. This here is the pulling force. And from here to here, we make the substrate potential U naught smaller and smaller. If you have a large substrate potential, then of course there is a finite friction. Particles are deep in the potential minima. You have to apply quite some force to pull them out. But if you make it smaller and smaller, you see all of a sudden, the velocity, even at the smallest force, jumps to a finite value. And this simply means, so this part here, this value here, this is the static friction force. And if you plot the static friction force as a function of the substrate potential, then again, this is exactly the same data we plotted. You see there is a finite range of u naught values. Actually, these two curves, these correspond to that points here, where there is no static friction and only if you increase u naught above that value, 
static friction comes into play. Um, actually, uh, this has been this. Uh, you have seen the original prediction of this retransition has been kind of dormant since 1983. I mean, there were not too many people looking into it, and then all of a sudden, people got interested into that, right? So this is 2016, 2017, and what you see here is um, people. Uh, looking at atomic systems, they trapped uh, ions, ytterbium ions, in optical traps. Uh, in that case, five ytterbium ions, right, in a one-dimensional system. They were kind of following partially the idea of Serge Aubry of looking at a one-dimensional system, but this is not an infinite system. This is far away from being infinite. But what they still see is that the static friction force as a function of the subspace potential. The subspace potential was created by an optical lattice, which can be also, they could also change the amplitude. Also shows here a clear offset below uh, here. These are renormalized values below one. There is no static friction and only above there is a finite value. This here is a more recent um, publication um, um, of this, I think that's a group from MIT. There's a group uh, uh, in Germany from the PTB uh, um, uh, where they were, I think, in total they had 28 ytterbium ions. Uh, they were observing a soft mode, which is also indicating frictional sliding. So, but the message in both cases is right, there is. Uh, for those uh, systems, this is 1D finite change. Um, uh, there is still uh, this Aubry transition. They call it Aubry signature because this is not the true idea Aubry actually had in mind. Now, um, this was the situation when it comes to one-dimensional systems, which of course is a little bit artificial. I think we are more interested in true contacts which are two-dimensional in nature. And what is the situation there? <laughs> I already showed you this uh, plot here of this graphite graphene situation where you can really see that friction essentially disappears. Um, one can also show um, this is data of a monolayer of xenon on a copper surface uh, when you, um, uh, if you, if you start to make the copper surface vibrate, you can by measuring the quality factor of this oscillation, you can measure how strongly or what is the friction between a xenon and a copper. And this maximum here shows you there is also a frictional state. And um, this is uh, data from uh, Ludwig Bouquet's group, uh, who is now in Paris, uh, who even demonstrated that if you have carbon nanotubes and you pull them uh, so if you have multiple carbon nanotubes and you pull them apart, there are also certain situations where the static friction goes away. However, while these experiments actually display superlubricity, so the absence of static friction, it is not evidence for the Aubry transition itself because they, they don't show a transition. If you want to make a point about the transition, you should change a parameter and then see that whatever your order uh, parameter somehow responds to that. Um, also, um, they, um, they could not measure here, uh, they couldn't provide microscopic information. Of course, it would be interesting how particles actually move relative to the subspace potential in order to avoid static friction. I think that would be very interesting. And finally, the simulations on the 2D Aubry transitions I've shown you before, they suggest that in two-dimensional uh, system, the Aubry transition should be a first-order structural phase transition. In contrast to the continuous phase transition which has been predicted by Aubry in one-dimensional systems. And if you have a first-order phase transition, you know this implies that you have coexistence. In that specific case, it would imply that there should be a coexistence between a superlubric and a pin phase. And this is exactly what we were aiming to uh, figure out to find in our experiments. So the <coughs> experiments have been done exactly in the same spirit as before. We have uh, our interfering laser beams, but this time now on purpose we were adjusting the 
uh, the, <coughs> the spacing of the colloidal lattice to be incommensurate to that of the uh, uh, sorry of the laser lattice to be incommensurate to the colloidal lattice this is typical situation actually the incommensurability was even larger than before and what you see now is <coughs> the velocity of the mean velocity of this colloidal monolayer as a function of the pulling force and again similar as in the numerical simulations we have now varied the substrate potential and indeed you see, so going from here to here, we decrease the subspace potential. You see for large subspace potential, there is clearly, I mean, the, the green data points hardly, uh, uh, there the monolayer hardly moves, but you clearly see here a static friction. But if we make the subspace potential smaller and smaller, then you suddenly see that there is no static friction anymore even if you apply the smallest possible force which is one femtonewton in our case we see here already a finite uh, velocity of the monolayer um, <coughs> you can convert that data in mobility so mobility is mean particle velocity divided by a force and again you see the same thing um, if you are at uh, subspace potentials on the order of 40 kbt or so you see the mobility at small forces is zero but if you then reduce it to about 33 or 38 kbt you see even at the small force there is already a, f a, s a finite uh, mobility now to extract these are of course a little bit noisy data how to extract now the static friction force well we simply said we apply here a line which corresponds to the mobility of 10% of a freely sliding monolayer so if there would be no subspace potential and whenever this mobility crosses this value from below this is what we identify as a static friction you could also define it in a different way but this would not uh, change the story too much this is just a way to obtain well-defined values of the static friction force well, and this is now what you see here. This is the static friction force as a function of the corrugation amplitude. This has been already normalized to that amplitude where the mobility drops down here if you apply our smallest um, uh, pulling force. And you see here, as we have seen also in the simulations before, there is a finite value below 34 kbt roughly in our experiment there is no static friction and then static friction starts to increase and <coughs> the um, the uh, open symbols here this is just a result of a Brownian dynamic simulation and you see there is very nice agreement between our experiment and that simulation now <coughs> the question is um, how how we understand that what's the microscopic picture I'm always a fan when when dealing with colloids the nice thing is you can really see the system you can uh, not only calculate some some quantities uh, you don't have access to but here you can really see everything and the question we were asking is how the colloidal monolayer manages to avoid static friction and this is what I want to show you here um, this here is now um, for increasing subspace potential. I just show you a couple of snapshots. Uh, the incommensurate colloidal monolayer. Um, in blue, you see the alignment of the substrate. And in red, you see the alignment of the orientation of the uh, colloidal monolayer, right? And if there is a very weak or might be zero subspace potential, then of course there are the different orientations of the colloidal crystal and the substrate th they are completely uncorrelated right they they don't know each other so they that can be um, a specific value here this is already at a very small substrate potential so we have here an angle theta and if you now increase the substrate potential uh, two things happen the first thing you see again this these white areas this is what we have seen already before this is this domain walls uh, which are due to the non-commensurability but in addition you see that the monolayer gets more and more aligned along the subspace potential again that's not a surprise because if you make the subspace potential deeper and deeper the particles of course align more and more it's like the the eggs in the egg carton right of course they follow 
the symmetry and the alignment of the depressions in the carton, right? And this is exactly what happens here. And what you can do now, you can plot now this angle theta as a function of the substrate potential. And again, you see this misfit angle theta decays exactly at a value of one, which means that there is a strong correlation between the onset of the of retransition and this angle theta. Mm -hmm. That was already with a finite um, but non-zero non subspace potential. I mean, if you, if you, so this one is clear, right? And if you, if you go to smaller and smaller values, uh, if you, s for example, do it from that way, then of course the system will, um, that the particles want to recover, so to say, their own structure, and that is why it rotates away, okay? This is something, again, this is well known. This is, has been, I think, uh, figured out in the 50s. This is the mctag novaco angle, which has been also known from the study of atomic acerbates and, 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 and crystalline uh, surfaces. So the point here is that we have here a clear correlation between the, um, between the, um, be I mean, still see here even in that situation the particles want to minimize their free energy right so they still see a little bit the subspace potential right on the one side they want to minimize their interaction energy on the other hand they also want to minimize the interaction energy with the subspace potential and this balance this is a kind of a counterplay they there are two different uh, so to say forces and this leads then to this compromise yeah Okay, now we have seen that this angle obviously is very, this decay of this Novaco angle here is actually characteristic for this of retransition. And now just as a kind of a, an, an, a simple way to understand why such a misfit angle is helping the system to avoid the static friction, I show you this cartoon here. So in, in red and orange, you see the subspace potentials and in black, you see the colloidal particles. And the idea I think about it is if the particles here, the black particles, if it would be fully commensurate, they would sit here in the red dots, right? They would sit in the subspace potential. If I then apply a pulling force in that direction, every particle have to go up the valley, then uh, the hill, then go down. So that is taking a lot of energy. But by tilting the sample, you see a lot of particles don't move, they avoid just going through the maximum corrugation. They are more staying at the elevations, right? As you would do when going uh, hiking. So you're not always going up and down. Might be you, you find a path where the elevation is pretty similar. And this is exactly the way the particles avoid uh, static friction. That's at least my interpretation on that. Um, so what we what we can do now, um, um, what we what you see here colored is this for is for a somewhat larger system. I colored with, uh, for you in red and blue those parts of a larger crystal which are tilted, and in gray I colored those which are not tilted. And the tilted ones we have seen these are those which are super lubric, which don't have static friction because they avoid going into the valleys while those which are, uh, so to say, which are perfectly aligned with the crystal and we have with the substrate, and this exactly happens more and more if we increase the substrate potential, they are plotted in gray here. And what you now see here, if you increase you not, if you are below the of retransition, we have essentially only tilted domains, which means that the entire system is super lubric. And if we go to very large you not, this corresponds to that situation, all the domains are aligned, so this is a fully pinned state. And what you see now in between, there is actually a coexistence range, a co coexistence regime where you find equally pinned and non-pinned area. And this is exactly what you would have expected um, uh, um, uh, for a first order phase transition. This is exactly the coexistence of pinned and unpinned regions I was talking about before. Now, <coughs> this is now the number, the fraction of superlubric particles as a function of the renormalized subspace potential. 
and what you see here, this is now the result of the simulations. Might be the agreement is not as perfect as before, but I think the general trend is clearly seen. And something we cannot, we tried it, but obviously our resolution was not sufficiently good. But something you nicely see in the simulations, if you ramp U0 up and if you ramp it down, there is a hysteresis, again, a clear signature of a first order uh, phase transition. Okay, then this would correspond to this um, to this um, coexistence regime here. <coughs> now, um, another another way to to understand the absence of static friction is uh -huh, there's a question, yeah. The U naught is modified by changing the light intensity, right? The light intensity sets the Right, below below one there is no static friction, right? I mean the static friction still disappears here, but this is now just another quantity, right? Which is so wh what's your point? You say this should fall down immediately or below you're not we have we don't have static friction yet? You, uh -huh, you see, this is just a renormalization factor. This you see, okay, I have to go back here. You see, we just determined from that potential where the mobility drops down at the smallest force, right? This is just a renormalization factor. This is depends, of course, on the interaction of our particles. This is, I mean, I have to say, as an experimentist, I would have loved always, I prefer KBTs, but the theoreticians told us, no, we want to have renormalized units, and that's the reason why uh, this is uh, like that, right? This is just a constant. This is depends on the particle density. It depends on the lattice constant. It depends on the charge of the particles, right? Okay. All right, now um, there's another way to interpret the absence of static friction. If there is no static friction, this means that the energy, the total energy of the system becomes translationally invariant, right? Only then it doesn't matter whether the system is here or here. I don't need energy to move it, okay? And um, this is what I tried to, to, to illustrate here. If you <coughs> if you go to a pin state, then of course the energy is not translationally invariant. If you think about you move now that monolayer here, then of course the energy will first go up and then it will go go down. Um, uh, this is seen by the fact if you measure the probability of the phases of the particle positions relative to the substrate in a pin state, this is a non-ergodic state, right? P particles are always located essentially at the same phase. That is a kind of a, uh, a sharp uh, curve. If you want to achieve that the system is, uh, that the energy is translationally invariant, this means that you must not have only particles at the potential minima, but you must also have particles at potential maxima. And when you now apply a force, might be this particle here will lower its energy because it goes down, but this part particle here will move it up, right? And uh, the, the fact that there is no change of the energy as a function of the displacement means that this is an ergodic system, meaning that you find particles at all positions relative to the substrate potential. This is what I wanted to indicate by that flat curve here, okay? And uh, this also means that you, and, and we were particularly seeking now where actually are the particles sitting uh, relative to the, to, the, uh, to the substrate potential. And so this again is our substrate potential. And what we were doing now is we were measuring 
the particle positions relative to the next to the to the next uh, subspace potential, and then we were mapping everything into the Wigner side cell. So every point is here a particle somewhere sitting on the lattice, and its distance from the center tells you what is its relative distance to its closest subspace potential minimum. Okay. And this is how it looks like, just concentrate here on the inner part. This is how it looks like now for increasing subspace potential. Of course, if the subspace potential is zero, uh, there is no reason why particular positions of the particles are more likely than the others, so that's a flat distribution. But even if you now increase the subspace potential, you see that even here at the saddle points, which are not particularly attractive for a particle, they are still occupied. And this is true even for 0.9 times UC. And if you then go above, then there is a sudden collapse, so to say, in phase space. You see that now the particles prefer only to uh, occupy the regions close to the potential minima. And this, I think, is another nice evidence uh, that we have here a transition from a uh, ergodic to a uh, to a non-ergodic state, as this has been also predicted um, uh, in simulations. And uh, in order to quantify that, we were just measuring. I think the particles here in this in this uh, purple areas close to the to the saddle points, and this is shown here again. The experiments in red, the simulations in 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 white. Again, you see here there is a hysteresis when you do the simulations, which again could not be resolved in experiments. But I think this is uh, overall good agreement between our experiments and these uh, data. And now the question is, how much how much time do I have? Do I have a couple of minutes? Okay, okay. Might be I won't use up 20 minutes, but. Um, I wanted to show you something else also related to friction. Yep. Um, and there is no potential. Right. That is a good question. Um, actually, I can't answer that right now. I have to think about it, right? If that would be a crystal, that is true. Um, uh, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. Might be it's because of the. Uh, might be might be because of the different domains. We have different domains. I have shown you. Uh, that's average over the exactly we have taken the entire oh good question okay i yes uh, that is because of the different domains right if you just would average over single domain then you are right then you would have only certain positions right here here it's not a problem because at large potentials you squeeze you 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 force them right then then that is not an issue right no, because then uh, the domains break up because then the interaction of the particle with the subspace are much larger than the particle-particle interaction. Okay, now um, I'd like to slightly switch the topic, but it's still related to friction. I briefly want to talk about quasi-crystals, and um, uh, might be you heard about those. Uh, quasi-crystals are um, materials which so to say, are uh, not periodic. If you have periodic materials, you can easily show that in a plane, uh, they must have two, three, four, uh, and six-fold rotational symmetries. Uh, this is, for example, if you want to uh, put tilings in your bathroom and you want to cover the walls, I guess if you check at home, uh, you won't have five-fold tiles because if you would do that, you would open voids, okay? That's why this type of symmetries are considered to be the, uh, the, the typical, the classical uh, crystalline uh, rotational symmetries. And then, uh, and, and Daniel Schechtman received actually the Nobel Prize for, for that in 2010. At the, in at the end of the 1970s, he discovered a phase which was made of a, 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 a ternary or binary, I think it was a ternary metal compound, he observed a phase, if you count here the fraction peaks, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Tenfold rotational symmetry. 
And what's even more surprising, if you, if you know a little about diffraction, you immediately see, aha, these are sharp peaks. And sharp peaks mean there is perfect order, okay? What that suggests is, and that is why one calls those quasi-crystals, not they are approximate crystals, might be not as good as crystals. They are perfect crystals in a sense that they are perfectly ordered. They have true long-range order, but they are not periodic, okay? And this is exactly what this quasi-crystal is all about. Um, I'm not going too much into details how you make them, how you can explain them, but let me just come back uh, to make the, the relation to friction. What makes quasi-crystals interesting and fascinating, not only from a mathematical point of view, but also from an applied point of view, is that they have very unusual bulk properties, but also very unusual surface properties. In particular, they have a low friction coefficient. And this can be seen here. This is a scanning experiment uh, on a, on a quasi-crystal. And the quasi-crystal is cut in a way that if you scan in one direction, this is the surface, it's cut in a way that if you scan in one direction, you probe a periodic surface. If you scan into another direction, you probe a quasi-periodic surface. That's simply because most quasi-crystals, for example, this tenfold, this decagonal quasi-crystal, is comprised of planes which are quasi-crystalline, but these planes are periodically stacked on top of each other, right? And therefore, by if you do uh, a cut in the right direction, you can just, by changing the scanning direction probe, periodic and quasi-periodic direction at the same time. And what you see here is the friction, this lateral friction probe by an A AFM experiment is quite high in the periodic direction and quite small in the aperiodic direction. It is not clear why that actually is. And that's, again, the reason why we said, okay, might be we can also contribute to that. And this is why we were making now quasi-periodic light fields, quasi-periodic substrate potentials. We now replace the 111 surface by a quasi-periodic substrate potential. And this can be achieved by superimposing uh, five laser beams. And this here is the interference pattern. I think you immediately see that this is not a crystal, <coughs> but uh, you also see that is this is not completely disorder, right? And you find here, here this uh, five main axes, which are imposed by our five incident laser beams. You also find here certain motifs which repeat all over the place. This is a so-called um, flower, which is the motif with the highest rotational local motif with the highest uh, local rotational symmetries. But you also see a lot of pentagons. You see them in different orientation. You see them in different sizes. And interestingly, if uh, the size of, cr of this one, the length of this one to this one is always related to the golden mean. I'm, I'm sure you heard about the golden mean. That's some uh, quantity which is strongly related to that quasi-crystal. It's just one plus square root of five half. And we find that all over the place. And also if you make a line through a high symmetry direction and make a tick whenever you cross here a substrate potential, then you only find two distances. You find large distances and small distances. And this sequence here, this is the famous Fibonacci sequence, right? And um, it's an aperiodic one-dimensional sequence. It never will repeat. Sometimes you think, oh, now it's close to repeat, but then you will see it never repeats itself. You can continue it. There's a rule how to make that. You can extend it as long as you want. And that's, again, a typical feature. And the reason I'm showing you that is simply to convince you that our light patterns have exactly the same structural properties as an atomic quasi-periodic surface. Now we can put colloids on that. And, um, the, and uh, the nice thing is now we can now gradually increase the substrate potential. And this is what I want to show you here. Also, we can do diffraction, but now we can use light diffraction because our colloids are much larger than atoms. We don't have to do X-ray diffraction, as I've shown you in the uh, picture of, uh, um, of, of, of the true quasi-crystal um, I, we have seen before. And what you see now is, if you look here, gradually there appear here 10 
diffraction spots and this movie has been taken by starting with a colloidal disordered system and then gradually increasing the substrate potential and gradually make the particles go into the go into the substrate potential wells okay and so you can nicely see how we go from a fluid into a quasi crystal now might be i skip i uh, know actually well no i can skip that here we can do a lot of stuff playing around we also find phases which are kind of phases between a crystal and a quasi crystals which also have been seen in atomic system but what i want to tell you and this is then almost my last slide is we can now do such friction experiments also on quasi periodic surfaces of course quasi periodic surfaces are also incommensurate because they have a completely different structure as our hexagonal colloidal uh, uh, substrate and you also see here a very large velocity and in those experiments actually we were not smart enough to going further down but it looks like there's almost I, I'm, I'm not sure what happens really here whether there is a finite static friction but you see the friction here the dynamical friction is definitely smaller than that even of incommensurate of course also than commensurate surfaces and we were asking um, um, what is so to say the microscopic mechanism for that and what we realized is uh, and this is what you see here these are the particle trajectories if you drive the system in that direction and in contrast to what I've shown you before particles do not really follow the direction of the force they always make here the, this 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 undulations here and then we were trying at what position of the substrate they are actually doing that and they do that exactly at these sites where we have these tenfold local motifs um, which provide here a kind of a corral of substrate potentials which have a perfect rotational symmetry and what we realize is that very similar to the one-dimensional case where we had this consecutive hopping of particles leading to kings we have a similar thing but now they move here along that circle so if you bend up that circle I this is the way i look at it it's also something periodic but now along a curve coordinate and what we believe uh, this has not been confirmed uh, by atomic experiments or so but what we believe is there are also kings there are local kings which provide a very efficient rapid mass transport and therefore lead to a reduced friction right at these high symmetry motifs okay so as the last slide uh, this is what we currently do uh, Jing Kao he's he just started uh, this year to work as a postdoc in my group we are now not looking at extended monolayers what we can do now is colloidal clusters and we can put them on topographical substrates and we tilt them so to apply a driving force and there's another interesting effect and I just show you that you see the white line here is the trajectory of the center of mass and if you carefully look you see something strange is happening the trajectory is not following the direction of gravity right and this is what is called directional locking and this is and this is work in progress we are just working on it but what you see here the different colors indicate to you where the crystal is particularly trapped this is an incommensurate crystal and as it moves here and then the party will fall into such a hole of the substrate and this leads then to forces also with a component perpendicular to the gravity this also leads to rotational forces so the message is if you have an incommensurate cluster even if you drive it in one direction it might not go where you want it to go it might escape uh, to the side okay and with that i i think i can skip my summary again thank you very much um, and i'm happy to have more questions <laughs> Um, okay, well, yeah, okay, so the question, I'm not sure whether everybody heard it, is to, to combine now the talk from yesterday and the talk today somehow, right, to combine potential landscapes plus active particles. Um, yes, we, we are working on that so far. I showed you yesterday a, a simple type of a, 
pore-like confinement, but we are also working on particles in pattern, moving in pattern channels, in particular when you go to viscoelastic fluids, where we have seen there is a lot of things changing, then it becomes really interesting. And of course, there have been other people, uh, you know, Wilson Poon's group, who was uh, studying active motion in, in crystals. Uh -huh, on the friction. We haven't thought on the friction yet. Might be the main part from the friction of the active particles would then come from the, the viscous solvent anyway. I, I don't know, right? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, okay, I think your, your question refers to the fact, well, what are viscous forces? Uh, do that is actually, that was my main concern. I also said, oh, we have to take care about the viscous forces. Actually, it turns out that we understand this directional locking without taking into account viscous forces. The velocities are quite small, I should say. E everything is close to a surface. Um, I'm not saying that viscous, viscous forces certainly also um, uh, limit the total velocity, but you don't need them to understand this, uh, oops, this, this uh, directional locking here, right? For that, it's just the, 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 the interlocal interaction between the particle and the subspace. That's sufficient if you include that, and then this uh, drops out. Thank <laughs> you.